Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Yolanda Strader, your guest host for today's programming. I'm a double alumna of the University of Miami with degrees in business and law. I'm a business litigation shareholder at Carlton Field, a member of the Citizens Board, and a proud Miami Hurricane. On behalf of the University of Miami Alumni Association, welcome to the first in a series of programming events showcasing women of the U. This series of candid conversations will feature some of the university's most dynamic, accomplished, and successful women highlighting the immense talent and strength of the Canes Network. The launching of this series today, Celebrating Women, is of special significance as we acknowledge that on this day 100 years ago, the 19th Amendment, prohibiting the states and federal government from denying the right to vote to citizens of these United States on the basis of sex, was ratified. This remarkable achievement and additional years of unwavering resolve resulted in all women, regardless of race, securing the right to vote. Women have a way of making things happen. This certainly holds true here at the U. Today's discussion is led by two extraordinary alumni, Marilyn Marshall and Alice Doma, who are following their passions, building a legacy, and making an impact on the corporate world as they lead through challenge and change. Alice Doma is the managing director of Morgan Stanley's multicultural client strategy team, where she works with her partners to strengthen the company's connections to the multicultural business community. During her time at Morgan Stanley, she has worked in various roles in the Global Capital Markets Division. Alice also worked in the Strategic Planning and Corporate Development Group at Sally May and in the Communications and Media Entertainment Department at the CIT Group. She serves on the boards of the New York Roadrunners and Freeform.org. She's also a member of the Executive Leadership on the President's Council and has stepped into the highest level of leadership, deepening her support of our beloved university by accepting a seat on the board of trustees. Marilyn Marshall is Senior Vice President, Executive Management and Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer for the Estee Lauder Companies. Marilyn joined the company in 1998 as VP of Human Resources for North America, a position she held until her promotion to Senior Vice President, Global Human Resources, in 2006. She assumed her current role in 2017. She began her career as a trial attorney with the Organized Crime and Racketeering Section of the United States Department of Justice and continued her government service as Deputy Director of the Commission on the Review of the National Policy Toward Gambling, a joint congressional and presidential commission. As a first-generation American born into a Cuban family, Marilyn was the first woman in her family to attend college. She also serves as a member of the Board of Trustees of the University and a member of the Board's Academic Affairs Committee. Now for some housekeeping. We invite you all to submit your questions throughout this conversation by using the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to address as many of your questions as possible, time permitting. Now, without further delay, please give a warm Canes welcome to Alice and Marilou as they share wisdom on leading through challenge and change. I'm happy to hand our program over to Alice Silma. Alice? Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, and hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Mary Lou, thank you for being here with us. Very exciting to get this conversation uh, rolling today. And want to just start off really at the beginning. So I've read your background. I think we have a few things in common as for where we went to high school and college. Uh, and, and then we started to diverge a little bit in our paths. Um, but can you share a little bit more um, with us about you personally, your family, um, your, your brothers and sisters, how you grew up? Uh, interesting to just learn a little bit more about that. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Great. Okay, great, okay. Yes, my family. Um, at, well, as you mentioned, I am from a Cuban family, um, a very small Cuban family, which I think is somewhat unusual for Cuban families. I am first generation. I was born in New York City when my father was positioned there. Uh, he held a role that is somewhat equivalent to what we would call today the executive director of the Cuban American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my father passed away when I was very young. And my mother moved us to Florida, thinking that we would be going back to Cuba. This was pre-Castro. And of course, we never went back. 
So I grew up in Florida um, in, a, in a small family, as I mentioned, I'm an only child. Um, my widowed mother and my widowed grandmother were my family, two very impressive women from whom I learned a great deal. That's fantastic. And you spent, uh, for, for, for what I understand, you're a Perry Mason fan when you were a little kid, mm -hmm. and that really actually uh, brought you into law. So can, can you explain a little bit about how you uh, wanted to become an attorney, which then goes into where, where you've gone in your career? Sure, and, and I must say, um, for those of you who are from a younger generation than I, the Perry Mason that I grew up with is very different from the Perry Mason that's on television today. Uh, my Perry Mason was a very distinguished, sort of portly gentleman whose goal was to root out injustice and to ensure that the innocent were set free and the guilty were punished. And I loved that. I was an idealistic child. And I grew up thinking that's what I want to do. I, I want to put bad people in jail and make the world a better place. And my grandmother, who was a very traditional um, Cuban woman, felt that it was not, it was unseemly for a woman to want to do that. And so what she would say to me repeatedly when we would watch this program together was, girls can't do that, dear. You can do what Della Street does. You can be the secretary, but you can't do that. And that really troubled me. So I spoke with my mother about that. And my mother said, honey, you can do anything you want to do as long as you're willing to work hard for it. Just don't tell your grandmother. <laughs> so I did grow up from a young age, from the age of eight, um, wanting to make the world a better place. And I did go into the Justice Department with that in mind. I did go in as a trial attorney with the organized crime and racketeering section of the Department of Justice. I was the first woman to be assigned to a strike force. And over the course of seven years, I did put a lot of bad people in jail, but obviously I did not make the world a better place. Well, you did your part. I think, I think you <laughs> definitely did your part. Um, and, and so that, that's actually very interesting. Your career has been um, varied, varied experiences, and it has all led up to the culmination of where we are today at Estee Lauder as Chief of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, how do you think those experiences have shaped how your position today and how you think about um, uh, your role and your influence and your impact at Estee? Well, each step along the way obviously helped shape it. Shape it. Each, each role that I've held has taught me something, whether it's been something more about the law, whether it's been something more about how to manage teams, whether it's been something more about uh, how to work in a corporate environment, which was not something I, I ever envisioned doing. Uh, but it's all culminated in what I consider to be my dream job. I absolutely, positively love what I do. And I think that's such an important thing in your career. And I, it, I know we'll get to career advice later on in the conversation, but I always tell people, if you love what you do and you do what you love, then you will never work a day in your life because it won't feel like work. Let's unpack that just a little bit more. I, I re recently read a quote where you said your only regret is that you did not get into this line of work earlier. Let's talk about that. What is it exactly about diversity and inclusion that you really like, particularly at a company like Estee Lauder? Um, how, do you, how do you think about that? What brings, you, what brings you to work with a smile on your face every morning? Well, for one thing, the company that I work for is a company uh, that truly values the concepts of inclusion and diversity. It's, it's not just something that we do. It's part of the DNA of our company. Um, and I have been working in the DNI space now at Estee Lauder since 2005. So this is not just something we're doing now because it's politically correct or because of some PR nightmare that we've had. This is something that we truly believe in. And I think it's reflected in our operations and in our structure and it's definitely reflected in our employees. I should mention that our company is 84% female. So I have not um, had any concerns about the male dominated workforce since I've been at Estee Lauder. Uh, definitely not. But I would say that I think that the roles that you've had prior to becoming a prosecutor, working with the uh, federal government, as well as some of your work in the gaming industry has been pretty male dominated. So while this is definitely a breath of fresh air, uh, how were you able to navigate some of those uh, roles and do you use any of those skills now? Well, 
you know, I, I think it's worth noting that I, I did graduate from law school 51 years ago. And I hope if some of you are looking at my photo on the camera, you're saying, gee, she doesn't really look that old. That's because Estee Lauder has some great products. But 51 years ago, the, the world was a very different place. Um, there weren't many female attorneys. Uh, there weren't any in the role that I was in. And I suppose it's very difficult to be the first or to be the only of anything because you don't want to mess it up. You don't want to mess it up for those who come behind you. And so I think when I started, my, my goal was to just be the best I could be and to work as hard as I could and to be as enthusiastic and as positive about what I was doing and how I was doing it as possible. And yes, I worked with a lot of men, obviously, uh, when I worked in law enforcement, they were all men, uh, white men, and not particularly um, empathetic. So I found that by keeping my head down and by working hard and by being factually oriented, fact-driven, data-driven, uh, by not being emotional, uh, that, was, that was the way to win them over and to gain their respect. And to an extent, I, I do that today, although I'm certainly not uh, fighting the same fight. I, I am still very analytical. I am fact-driven. I don't get emotional, at least not in public. And I think that, that serves us all well. How do you look at diversity and inclusion with respect to, from a company standpoint? So I know that Estee Lauder actually is one of the companies who is more of a pioneer, back to your point about you've been doing this for quite some time and you've been focused on diversity. How do you think, um, how do you envision the role and how, how do you believe it's good for business? Well, it's, it's obviously good for business in today's multicultural world uh, because our consumers are diverse. Our consumers are multicultural. And if we are not, as an organization, uh, representative of our consumers, then they're not going to be our consumers for very long. So I think there's a business case for diversity that almost doesn't need to be made anymore because it's, it's quite obvious. I think what is important in a multinational company like ours, though, is recognizing that in diversity and inclusion, one size does not fit all. And it does not necessarily mean the same thing in each and every country that we are in. We, we sell our products in 150 countries and diversity in some of those countries looks different. It is different. So we use a metaphor. We use the metaphor of an iceberg when we talk about diversity. And why an iceberg? Because only 10% of an iceberg typically is visible above the waterline. Consequently, 90% obviously is below the waterline and invisible. And the same holds true of our personal characteristics. Only about 10% of our personal characteristics are visible. And those are generally around race or ethnicity, gender, age, roughly. I mean, you may not know exactly what age a person is, but you will say, younger than I am, older than I am, or about the same age as I am. Uh, physical abilities, uh, if I were in a wheelchair or on crutches, you would notice that. Um, and the rest of our characteristics are not necessarily visible. I'm talking about characteristics like religion, like sexual orientation, like socioeconomic standing, like professional experiences and academic experiences. And so when we look at diversity, we need to take into consideration all of the personal characteristics, not just the ones that are visible. And as a result, it makes for a very interesting and a very um, uh, stimulating conversation as I travel the world, as I used to travel the world, obviously none of us are traveling the world right now, but uh, tailoring a diversity action plan for each specific country to make sure that it was representative of their needs, that it was locally relevant, and that addresses the issues and concerns that they had. And, and that's what's made this, um, this role so, so fascinating and also so productive because you learn as you go and you're able to impart best practices, you're able to share experiences across country borders and um, help each country to develop a plan that works for them. That's fantastic. It seems that the lauder companies might be on 
the pioneering edge of this of this discussion, particularly as you think about other uh, beauty industry companies, et cetera, who are still uh, primarily dominated by your white male uh, demographic. Do you do you agree with that statement that you're, you're pushing the boundaries a little bit? Have um, other companies in your space look to uh, implement some of the programs that you put in place? Well, you know, we're, we're definitely in a unique position. First of all, we were founded by a woman, Mrs. Estee Lauder, um, and she strongly believed in the power of women in leadership. Today, our, for example, our CFO is a woman, an African-American woman. Our general counsel is an African-American woman. 51% of our brand leadership is female. Um, over 50% of our international general managers are female. So, we are cutting edge when it comes to gender. And as I said, of course, the other characteristics differ from, from country to country. But we have started with the premise that awareness precedes action. And we started our initiative, our, our inclusion and diversity initiative, with programs, seminars, workshops designed to raise awareness. And with the idea that in turn that awareness created actions, which have gotten us to the point that we are today. So I, I do think uh, we try to be cutting edge. I do think that we are always looking to improve ourselves. Of course, we can always do better, and we know that. So this is something that we work on every day. And Alice, I think you're muted. Yes, I was. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, so <laughs> it seems that the results are, are coming through. Now, it's interesting because you have mentioned, and, and, and you've mentioned in other uh, interviews that you've done, about the importance of not being focused on the one and only. It seems as if you're looking to, and the company, at the company, you're also looking to bring women along. Can we talk about that a little bit in your career? How have you spent time uh, making sure to nurture the next generation so that you're not the only one on the pedestal, and when you look around, there's no one else but you? Can we talk about that just a little bit? Sure, and actually in some of my earlier roles, um, I was the one and only, and there weren't any other women for me to mentor or to <laughs> give advice to or to help or to sponsor along the way. That, that came a little bit later. But you know, I, I want to say that I have always made myself available to any woman who wants some advice, who wants to talk, who wants to share, who wants to cry, who wants to have a conversation uh, with another woman about her own career or her own challenges. And I think now it's, it's a unique opportunity for me in a company with so many women to be able to lead uh, workshops, to be able to lead counseling sessions, um, and to be able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. I think one of the things that I have always tried to impress upon women, but also this is true for men as well, uh, your first job is, is never your last job. It's a stepping stone. And if you are in a role that is not comfortable for you or a role that you are not happy with, don't be afraid to make change. Don't be afraid to take risks. I took risks and some of them could have backfired on me. Fortunately, they didn't. But you know, I think the time to make your decisions about careers is not just when you're in college, but once you're out in the real world. And so that's, that's the message that I've always tried to express to, um, to women. But as I said, the, the message also holds true for men. I think that a lot of women have, and, 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 and people of color, quite frankly, have probably taken um, risks in their career, and they're probably a little bit more, uh, less risk averse than, than, than others. Um, can we talk about some of the risks that you've taken, uh, particularly the ones that were super successful, and maybe even the ones that you've learned from, uh, and how has that actually managed to push your career forward, and again, continue to increase your impact? Well, I think probably the biggest risk that I took was when I left government and went to work for Playboy Enterprises. Uh, I had been interviewing with law firms and, and had uh, some opportunities lined up with law firms, and that would have been the safe route to go. But I was offered an opportunity with Playboy that struck me as being a very unique one, and indeed it was. It was the opportunity to join the company in a special counsel role with specific responsibility for the development and the creation of a casino hotel in Atlantic City, which at the time, they had just legalized gambling. 
And, and I took that job and I took it because I thought, hmm, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. There will always be a law firm. There will always be a more traditional role that I can go into if this doesn't work out. And the risk in that was um, that it was Playboy Enterprises, frankly, and that it was a, a casino business, which I knew very little about in terms of the creation of, of a hotel and creation of this industry, actually, in a city that had not had it before. So I think that was a risk. And it could have backfired. It could have meant that you know future potential employers would say, mm, Playboy, we don't want her. Um, but that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. And I will say, I, I met some extraordinary people working at Playboy, including Christy Hefner, the daughter of the founder, who was um, as, as much of a supporter of women as, as I am, and not more so. Um, and we worked together very well for about eight years. When I did move on, I moved on into the passenger shipping business. Again, huge risk. As an attorney, you know, I, I was pretty good, but I didn't know anything about admiralty law, nothing. And so, you know, there I was taking on a general counsel role with a passenger shipping company, knowing nothing about admiralty law. I did, however, know enough to hire the best talent I could find and to either bring them in-house or work with them as outside counsel to ensure that we didn't make any mistakes. Uh, you can't afford to make mistakes when the safety of lives at sea is at stake. So those were risks, but one opportunity led to another. And um, I, that's why I, I, I say, perhaps don't do as I did, but do as I say, <laughs> don't, don't be afraid to take that risk, but take it at a time in your life when you can afford to take it. Um, I would suggest early on in your career or at a time when you are more flexible in terms of your geographic mobility, uh, those are the times to go for it. That, that, that is great advice, excellent advice. Um, I'd like to pivot just a little bit into the current period we're in. How are things going, uh, particularly uh, now that folks cannot go into stores? Uh, how has the business been for uh, Estee Lauder and the Lauder companies? And, 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 and how's been the climate? COVID, social justice issues, uh, certainly questions around uh, our social fabric in this country, also worldwide. Um, what's going on? How, how are you thinking about that? Wow, how much time do we have? <laughs> let, let me start with the COVID situation first. Um, we, we saw it coming across the world. We saw it starting in China and Asia and the effect it was having on our business. So we actually had some lead time to prepare, anticipating that it might come all the way across. And it, of course it did. Uh, it affected our business dramatically in terms of the brick and mortar stores. But fortunately we had already built a very robust online business. And that has just been incredibly successful for us. Um, you know, we've lost passenger airline travel. Airline travel is down by, I think, the last number I heard was 97%. But people who used to shop in airports can also shop online. Um, our, our business is coming back in the stores. We have reopened selectively. We haven't reopened every store. And we have reopened them with the strictest of protocols. We've employed a medical advisory board, and they've advised us every step of the way in terms of the appropriate protective measures to take, not just to protect our own employees, because of course the health and safety of our employees is our first priority, but also to protect the safety of our consumers. And we're doing things a lot differently. If you've tried to buy cosmetics lately, you know that we don't have testers out there. Uh, we don't do the same level of, of personal touch that we did. Uh, and that's, that's all changed. But you know, the good news is we have a plan to improve our business as we go forward in the stores. We are doing well in terms of our stock. Our employee morale is good. Um, we have not reopened our headquarters offices yet. We've been working from home. I've been working from home since March 16th. And I must tell you, I don't like, I'm very much of a people person. And the one thing that we have lost is the spontaneous communication that happens when you're all in an office, when you meet in the hallways or in the pantry and you have conversations with people that perhaps you don't work with every day. That, that's what's missing. But uh, we've adjusted, we've adapted, and we are being as productive, uh, if not sometimes more so, than we were before. Uh, for those of you who might live in the New York area, you know that commuting 
takes a great deal of many people's time. Uh, and I'm one of the fortunate ones. I do, I did walk to the office, but we had people on my team. I had people on my team who had a two hour commute each way. That's four hours a day spent on a train or a bus or in a car. That's four hours that they now gained back and they can spend some of it working, but they can spend some of it with their family too. So it, it, there is a silver lining to this. I, I keep telling myself that as well as my team. In terms of the racial injustice issues, uh, that has affected us very deeply because we are a company that cares. And we have created a racial equity committee. Um, we've come out, come out with a number of commitments that we're making to the black community, to our black employees and our black consumers. And it has to do with increasing our representation in the workforce. It has to do with increasing the dialogues that we have around these issues. It has to do with um, taking a second look at our brands and making sure that our brands are responsive to our consumer. And in short, it's a group that's led by senior leaders of the company, uh, crosses all functions, all brands, uh, specific to the US at the moment, but there are many social injustice issues and we certainly know there are social injustice issues elsewhere in the world. And our global reach is increasing as we attempt to cover those as well. So, oh, and, and philanthropic contributions as well have, have been part of our social and racial equity project. So it's, it's a time for us all to pause and to reflect, uh, to have the conversations, which are sometimes difficult conversations. I always say that you have to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. And people tend to avoid speaking about racial issues. They avoid it because they're not comfortable. Why are they not comfortable? Some are not comfortable because they don't want to say the wrong thing and offend someone. Others are uncomfortable because perhaps the wrong thing has been said to them, evidencing insensitivity about their race. And so we've had a series of workshops around this. Um, there's a great book that's been published. The title is So You Want to Talk About Race. The author, Ijeoma Oluo, is a Nigerian, uh, her, she's the child of a Nigerian father and an American mother, and she speaks very compellingly about how to have these conversations. I'm not selling her book, but I, I do highly recommend it. So it's it's a topic that um, you know that we we all deal with every day. And I assume, and that's great work that you're doing. And one of the questions I have is, um, I assume that's in in, a, in addition to all of the other. Um, aspects of diversity that you bring onto the platform. So how do you think about uh, prioritization? How do you think about in, you know, being inclusive and making the issues that are rising above today part of the inclusion fabric? How are, how are you working towards that? And, and how are you making uh, the environment more safe for employees uh, to, to begin to either bring their authentic selves to work or talk about things that are on their minds or address microaggressions, other types of um, occurrences in the workplace that are a little bit more subtle? Well, we have a continuing series of, of conversations and or workshops. Uh, for example, our introduction to inclusion and diversity, our, our 1.0 workshop is entitled How We Work Together and Why It Matters. And that's a basic introduction to the premises of the concepts of inclusion and diversity. And we talk about micro inequities and micro aggressions and how to deal with those. If you are the, the recipient of one, how do you discuss it? Who do you discuss it with and in what context? Uh, this is all part of our workshop. Then we have our unconscious bias workshops, you know, even more compelling in today's world, but nevertheless, we've been doing those for several years as well. These workshops, as I said, go, go back years, but of course we've customized them and, and modernized them to fit current situations. And as we've taken them around the world, we've also customized them for the countries that we are delivering it in. So we have tailored the message from country to country. But the unconscious bias workshop is, is particularly um, in demand these days because it's top of the mind awareness with everyone. And then we also have an inclusive leadership workshop where we actually work with our leaders to help them to be more inclusive in terms of what does that mean and how do they uh, create an inclusive environment for their teams. We've taken inclusion really to the next level and we call it belonging. Uh, this came from a, a 
an employee who said to me, you know, I, I feel included. I have a seat at the table, but I want to feel that I belong. I want to feel that my voice really is being heard and, and valued. And so we launched a program last year. Uh, it was actually our inclusion and diversity week theme. We had this theme throughout an entire week and we called it the beauty of belonging. And we had employees tell us what it means to them to feel that they belong or to feel the opposite, that they don't belong. And, you know, it was interesting for me because I, I totally feel that I belong at Estee Lauder. I've been here for 23 years now. And if I didn't feel that I had belonged, I would have left a long time ago. But in reflecting back on some of the earlier parts of my career, I think, hmm, yeah, I was included, all right. But I didn't necessarily felt that I belonged. I was not part of the old boys club. I did not go play golf with them on weekends. I didn't belong, but I was included. So I, I totally feel and understand the difference. So on that note, and we're, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up on time, but how, what types of advice, clearly uh, there's great work being done inside the Lauder companies. What types of advice would you give uh, some of our uh, listeners, uh, women here, people of color, to think about how to increase their belonging, how to deal uh, with situations and, and work uh, situations that may not be as inclusive um, as the one that you've created at the Lauder companies. Any advice that you would give, particularly as people are moving into senior leadership roles or are looking to uh, increase their, their impact at, at those levels? Well, again, you know, one size does not fit all because a lot of it has to do with who your manager is and, and what the DNA of your company is. And so I guess, you know, step number one would be look around you and, and get a sense of, um, of whether you feel that you belong and if not, why not? And, and be analytical about that. I would also say if you feel uncomfortable talking to your manager about racial issues or ethnic identity or sexual identity, uh, then perhaps you're not working for the right manager. But uh, you certainly would have somebody in the organization, I would hope, whether it's HR or a diversity officer, that you could express yourself to. I think it's important to make your feelings known. And if you can talk to your manager about it, by all means, I invite you to do that. Because oftentimes a manager, particularly if, if they are of a majority, either a majority gender or a major, majority race, um, may not even think about these things. They may not be acting in an evil way, they may have positive intent, but they're perhaps not aware. So back to my other comment, raising awareness is key because awareness precedes action. And I think there are ways to have these conversations that are safe. Um, they have to be comfortable for you because if you're not comfortable having the conversation, then perhaps you're not gonna get your message across in the right way. Um, but again, as I said, one size does not fit all and I, I wouldn't dare to give advice to everyone on this score, but I honestly do feel that airing the issues and being able to talk about the issues is key to getting anything changed. Last, last question, because I know we have to leave time for questions and I'm trying to be a little bit selfish, but last, last question here is, in this time of uh, working from home, you mentioned earlier that we've lost a little bit of the community, some of the natural informal networking that happens when you're just passing by each other in the hall. I might be able to give you a quick update on what's going on. Can't necessarily do that in the same way. How, do, how would you recommend folks be able to stand out uh, with respect to differentiating themselves for others uh, for promotion or really making sure that their contributions have been made. In some respects, it might be easier with the re uh, working from home environment, but in some respects, it's not. What advice might you have there? Uh, well, first of all, team building and building collaborative relationships remains perhaps perhaps more important now than, than it was before. Uh, being on calls, being on Zoom calls where you actually show your face as opposed to having the screen blacked out. Um, speaking up, which is sometimes difficult on a Zoom call because you feel like you're interrupting someone. Uh, if you speak too soon and if you don't speak soon enough, somebody else gets in ahead of you in the, in the queue. Uh, but I think exhibiting your, uh, your enthusiasm, um, volunteering for opportunities that come along that may not be within your necessarily within your day job, but an opportunity to see and be seen by others. 
I think also ensuring that you have constant communication with your manager and that he or she knows exactly what it is you have accomplished and what you are doing. Uh, it's easy enough to get lost in the shuffle and just keep turning out the work, but not getting the recognition for it. So, you know, speaking up and speaking out, I think is key. Um, having empathy for others and ensuring that everyone on your team, if you're a team leader, understands that, you know, you, that you understand that they have issues that perhaps you don't have. Uh, I don't have children. I don't have child care issues. I do have an elder care issue. And I'm totally empathetic when somebody tells me that she has to sign off early because she has to deal with her child's homeschooling. These are, these are things that we need to be sensitive to and to ensure that people know that as a team leader, uh, you're there for them. All right. Mary Lou, we could do this for the rest of the afternoon, quite frankly, but uh, I, I, I do need to open up for questions. So uh, we, got, we got to speak up and speak out. So I really like that. I'm gonna uh, invite uh, this group, Yolanda, let's, let's see if we can get some folks to speak up and speak out. Absolutely, that was really wonderful. Thank you, Mary Lou, and, and thank you, Alice, for guiding that conversation, an important conversation about DNI. Um, Marilyn, the first question we have up for you is, uh, what strategies do you find effective in developing allies and buy-in for your DNI work? Uh, I think, you know, that it's perhaps a sad statement, but true, that um, business results always lead to buy-in. And I think the fact of our diverse consumer base has been instrumental in helping us to get our messaging across because uh, the strategy of developing a diverse consumer, whether that means race, whether that means age, whether that means gender, requires people on the team that are of those characteristics that do know how to reach that consumer. So uh, it's like the chicken or the egg, which comes first? Do you have a diverse consumer and then you go out and hire people to match up? No you hire first and they help you find that consumer. They help lead you to that consumer. So I think the business case is always the driving factor. Um, we like to think of ourselves as having a lot of um, empathy. I've used that word before, but, but our family values also come into play and that's where the inclusion aspects come into play. So I, I think uh, you know, for, for most companies, the business strategy, the business results that can be gained by having a diverse workforce is always a compelling factor. Excellent, thank you. And we have another question for you. As a senior executive with a major corporation and also a member of the board, what are your feelings regarding philanthropy and civic engagement? Well, civic engagement, let me start with that one because that's, that's huge with us right now. We have formed a civic engagement task force at Estee Lauder and, and the focus and the goal, uh, and by the way, it's, it's, not, it's not partisan in any way, shape or form. The concept behind the civic engagement task force is making sure we get the vote out. At no time has it been more important that everyone registers their vote. And I think at this particular time, people are a bit scared uh, they're hearing a lot about mail-in ballots. Uh, they don't want to go to the polls because of contagious aspects of, of being in a crowd. And so what our task force is doing is, is really talking to people about the importance of, of registering to vote if they haven't already, the importance of voting in whatever form feels comfortable for you, and not using the current situation as an excuse to stay home and not be counted. So civic engagement is, is hugely important. Uh, from a philanthropic standpoint, I, I'm blessed in the fact that I, I work for a company that is very philanthropic and our activities in that area focus on a number of different things. We support girls' education, uh, not only in the United States, but in a lot of our underserved third world countries, because obviously educating girls leads to educated young women, leads to educated women who are successful. So girls' education is a big theme for us. Also healthcare issues. Um, our, our chairman emeritus' late wife, Evelyn Lauder, founded the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. So we actively support that. Our chairman emeritus and his brother founded the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. We actively support that. And then through the different brands, we support charitable organizations or not-for-profit organizations 
that reflect a particular cause that they are interested in. So for example, one of our brands that's focused on marine life uh, supports an organization called Oceana. Uh, we have supported melanoma skin cancer foundations, uh, a number of different health related organizations. And then we also now, as I mentioned earlier, are involved in supporting organizations around racial equity and racial social issues. Very full plate. <laughs> so uh, our next question is, how did you transition to a very different industry than what you started out doing? You mentioned you made a very, uh, a series of bold transitions in your career and did so not necessarily being completely knowledgeable of that area, but obviously getting um, up to speed quickly. So could you talk about the, that transition or those transitions? Sure. Um, I think I was blissfully unaware of, <laughs> of how different these, these opportunities would, would be and how, what different directions they would take me in. Um, I like to say that there, there have been four basic areas that I've worked in, criminal law, casinos, cruise ships, and cosmetics. And the only thing they all have in common is they all start with the letter C. They could not be more different from one another. And um, whether it was um, naivete on my part or just uh, the enthusiasm to learn something new, to do something different, when presented with an opportunity that looked exciting and that felt exciting, I followed my heart and it worked, it worked. Um, but I've been very fortunate in that regard. And the transition wasn't all that difficult as long as I stayed within my functional expertise. So for example, the first two roles were primarily, well, criminal law was totally a legal role. Moving into the casino business, I started as an attorney and then added on to that, added on human resources, added on security, added on. So I, I grew the role. Moving into the, the cruise ship business, same thing. I came in with an, a, a legal uh, responsibility as general counsel, plus an administration responsibility and added on. And then coming into Lauder, the choice was, I actually had to make a choice between the legal area or the HR area because the company is so large that I couldn't have done both. And I was being spoken to about both. And I chose human resources because I thought that would get me closer to the people and it would give me a broader scope across the organization, uh, which it has. And then adding on to that, the inclusion and diversity piece. So the transitions have been from very diverse industries to other diverse industries, but the functional areas have remained the same, the legal and the HR responsibilities. Excellent, so the next question is, is for both of you. Um, so Marilee, you mentioned that you're not emotional in the workplace, uh, but obviously you may be in private. And the question is, do you believe that being emotional hinders women from succeeding in a male-dominated industry? And it's for both you and Alice to respond to. I would say yes in a male-dominated industry, but then I would also flip that on its side and say, if you're an emotional man, if you're given to temper tantrums, for example, that's not going to serve you well in a female-dominated workplace. So I, I think there, there's a role for emotion, but controlled emotion. Uh, and, and I think it works both ways. Yeah, I would agree. It's, it's interesting because I think it's not necessarily showing emotion in the workplace, uh, particularly in a male dominated society because on Wall Street there are many emotional men. It's the manifestation of that emotion. So women tend to cry uh, if they get upset. Some women yell, I sometimes am a yeller. And, and those, that actually is not seen as emotional. It's really the tears because men can't deal with tears. And so uh, I, think, I think that that's some of the issue and just understanding how your emotions might affect uh, your advancement. But I would agree with Mary Lou. I think emotional men and people who break things like I've seen people do uh, and, and, and yelling and screaming and creating environments uh, that are fear-based are also not necessarily those that will help you advance either. So for both, I think it's detrimental. Uh, it just so happens, I think, that women uh, manifest emotions through tears and that a lot of times men just don't know what to do with it. 
in one, of our workshops, in one of our workshops, we talk about something that we call the double bind, which is that if a woman is aggressive and assertive, she is perceived negatively. If she is um, passive and gracious, she might also be perceived negatively as being not strong enough or not tough enough. Uh, and so I, I think there's, there's a fine line to be walked between those. Um, we, we tend to think of ourselves as um, uh, rational, <laughs> rational individuals and behave accordingly, but that might mean something different to different people. And I also think that when we are referring to um, someone as, as having male or female characteristics, we're also overlooking that wide spectrum in between. We all move across the spectrum from time to time. And uh, I, I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. Absolutely, thank you. Our, our next question is also for both of you. Do either of your companies provide internship or mentorship opportunities for minority women and men? And if so, how can uh, the audience learn more about those programs? Uh, we do. We have a summer internship program. We just completed it and it was quite fascinating to turn it into a virtual program because Typically, it's been an in-person program. So we did turn it into a virtual program. We gave the students the opportunity to opt out if they didn't want to do it virtually. They only two opted out, uh, and that's because they actually left the country. Uh, and so we, we do have this, this opportunity. We, we have mentorship informally within the company, but the internship is something we do every summer. This year, we had 157 interns of which 52% were diverse. Uh, and we post it on our Estee Lauder uh, website. So you can feel free to look it up there. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing it in person next year. I would say our firm uh, has an internship program that uh, operated for many years. And we do also uh, have opportunities for um, folks of color and women. And so you can learn more about it um, at morganstanley.com uh, around the opportunities available for uh, women in particular and, and, and people of color. Um, but at the same time, yep, we run our internship programs every year. This one was also virtual uh, and, and it was pretty successful. Those sound like really great programs. Alice, the next question is for you. Throughout your career, can you share what you did to set yourself apart that enabled you to attain the position of managing director at such a young age? I'm glad you all think I'm young. That's good. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, so, so, so uh, I would say first I graduated 20 years ago, 21 at this point, but um, a lot of it was, again, the, the points that were made earlier. Hard work at the beginning, hard work really begets more work. And so um, I was able to set myself apart and, and, and my calling card effectively was when I was an analyst, people could rely on me to get the job done and do it right. And as a result, I got more work to do, uh, which was lots of fun. Uh, but at the same time, while you're grumbling and up all night, people are taking notice. And so that leads you to uh, what, you know, the type of sponsorship that you need to get stretch assignments, to be able to be talked about in rooms when you're not present, uh, and then to receive this, the next promotion after the next promotion. And then what ends up happening is you grow your network uh, with people who can begin to be influential in your career. Sometimes you have opportunities to do other things. Um, I ended up going to work started my career at Morgan Stanley and worked at one of our clients because I happened to work on a project uh, where, where we were working with them. And then they said, do you, do you want a job effectively? And so I, I, I got my a job offer through the CEO of the company, um, which again, doesn't happen unless you've got great work and then people can vouch for you. Um, and then, and then that helps to further you grow your networks again. And, and as to, Mary Lou's point, you meet people who then see what you're able to do, have heard about you, 
uh, through their networks and then want to be able to offer you opportunities that will ultimately help their business results. And so I would say that's what's happened in every company that I've worked for, including Morgan Stanley, and has helped me uh, push my career and, and accelerate and advance my career. Um, who you know, make sure they're talking about you have the right sponsorship. Uh, and all of that is predicated and laid on a foundation of uh, flawless, flawless execution and good work. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to give you both the opportunity to provide some words of inspiration or a few brief closing remarks. Alice, we'll start with you. Yes, because I don't want to follow Mary Lou. I think she's going to save the best for last. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, she will, though. Um, I think I think this has uh, been a great discussion. I really uh, enjoy the questions that, that have come about. But at the end of the day, um, we spend a lot of our time at Morgan Stanley and what I'm working on in particular around the business case for multiculturalism. And it's all focused on making sure that uh, the playing field is level, because at the end of the day, it's good for business. It opens up opportunities. It gives you a bigger pie of which you can then claim your piece. You, in our business, what we call create alpha, which means you find value and opportunities that weren't there uh, previously. So you're actually able to move the needle and set yourself apart. Uh, we're missing that a little bit. We've written a couple white papers at Morgan Stanley around if we were to think about inclusive investing in a way that was uh, truly inclusive, we could add uh, more to our GDP and bottom line. And again, those types of business results are always ones that open open the eyes of everyone. So I, I do think you know this discussion was very important. Um, I, it's a space that I that I care deeply about and uh, loved loved hearing all of the things that pioneering company like the Estee the, the Estee Lauder companies are doing to also help push the effort and it also uh, contributes to the success that they've had as a company over time. Well, thank you, Allison. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to meet you virtually and to have this conversation with you both before we started the session and during the session. I, I've enjoyed meeting you and talking with you immensely. Um, I, I said to you before this started and, and before we actually went live, uh, I had said to Alice that the word unprecedented has really been overused of late and that I wasn't going to use it. Um, so I won't, but I will say that this is a time like none other. It's a time when the convergence of, of crises has really been extraordinary, whether it's COVID, whether it's racial injustice, whether it's hurricane season, which hopefully you all will uh, not have to worry about in Florida. Uh, we've had this convergence of crises and it's caused people to react in very different ways. I think some people have risen to the occasion and have excelled in their ability to meet the challenges and to power through them. I think other people have frankly fallen apart. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we've seen that in, in public displays as well as in private. But I, I just, uh, this is not a profound thought, but nothing lasts forever. Whether it's something good, unfortunately, or whether it's something bad, fortunately, nothing lasts forever. And so I'd like to leave with a quote from one of my uh, favorite people to quote from, which is Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, this time, like all other times, is a good one if we but know what to do with it. And I would just say, let's, let's know what to do with it. Let's use our time wisely. Let's use it well. Let's take advantage of the opportunities that it has given us, whether that means time with family or time to reflect perhaps more than we used to in our crazy lives. Um, and let's come through this stronger than ever. I thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And on behalf of the Estee Lauder companies, I, I thank you for your time. Alice and Marilyn, thank you so much for those remarks. Um, this was certainly a dynamic conversation on very important issues. And I, I want us to sort of go back to where we started discussing the ratification of the 19th Amendment and remind all of our participants to make sure they have a plan to vote and they register to vote, um, just as Marilu mentioned when she was discussing civic engagement. I also want to do a plug for the UM Alumni Association and some upcoming programming today and tomorrow. Um, at 5 p.m. today, there's a, a topple, the Topple Career Center presents three steps to fast-tracking your sixth 
figure career search. There's also a back to school virtual bingo hosted by the Keynes community benefiting student scholarships at 7 p.m. And tomorrow night, there's a Keynes conversation um, entitled Entertainment's Biggest Showstopper, and it's led by key leaders in the entertainment industry. So you can register for all these events and learn more about them by visiting alumni.miami.edu and clicking on the events tab. Um, so on behalf of the University of Miami Alumni Association, thank you for joining us for our inaugural event featuring dynamic and accomplished women of the U. We pause just for a moment to also highlight one such woman. She was the first woman to lead the University of Miami as its president during her 14-year tenure um, at UM. She solidified its position among top U.S. research institutions. Immediately prior to joining UM, she was the longest-serving U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services in the U.S. and followed her tenure at UM by winning Florida's 27th Congressional District seat and now serves in the U.S. House of Representatives. If you're not sure who we're referring to, she is our own Dr. Donna Shalala, and so we want to honor her briefly. And I want you to please stay tuned for more information to come from the signature series as we spotlight the women of the U. We'll end this afternoon with our signature cane salute. Panelists, please join me in raising your hands in salute of the U. As we remember, it's great to be a Miami Hurricane. Go Canes! Okay. Okay.